OK. Dear colleagues, on behalf of Renouveau Democracy, I would like to thank you for your loyalty and your presence with us today. I would also to thank Marie Pesé for sharing her expertise with us. I am Dikra Chaouch. I'm in charge of psychosocial risk prevention at Renouveau Democracy. Marie Pesé is doctor of psychology, psychoanalyst and former legal expert, head of the Souffrance et Travail, Suffering and Work Consultation Network. Marie has intervened for several years as an expert in our conferences and provide us with her expertise and sensitive issues. Replays are available on our website and our YouTube channel. Today, Marie will speak on harassment so that we can prepare for the negotiation on the future harassment policy. This conference will be held in English and you can ask your question in French. Donc, cette conference sera tenue en anglais, mais vous pourrez poser vos questions en français. Now I will now leave the floor to Cristiano, our president, the president of Renouveau et Democracy, who will explain our policy actions in more detail. Thank you. <coughs> many thanks, Dikra, and many thanks to Marie. Uh, I think that Marie is a well known in, the, in our institution, and we thank again Marie for uh, her intervention that have in a way opened the mind of uh, several actors in this field uh, because we were starting and complaining with the with negotiation on harassment that was based on the uh, denied reality trying to to just to ridiculize what we are preaching uh, about harassment and uh, especially pathogenic management uh, things have changed the commissioner has realized that things that must be improved uh, concept of benchmark taking into account the best products in member states has been now duly understood uh, and it's clear that france seems to be uh, the front runner on this respect and marie see, is the best expert in this field so we rely on all this technical and external expertise when we are at the table of negotiation uh, and it's now the right moment to to refresh some principle to take into account some experiences uh, because it's clear that when it comes to mention uh, france telecom la poste case law everyone understand exactly that it cannot be acceptable that same fact and conduct cannot be uh, spot in the inside the commission that everything can be just put under the the carpet <clears throat> so i leave the floor to maria and uh, to, and i want to thank her again uh, for uh, for uh, her contribution perhaps maria if through your presentation you can uh, focus up more than usual on what is the pathogenic management products and what is institutional harassment i think that we manage more or less to to make clear what is a harassment made by one individual. But when it comes to deal uh, uh, with a pathogenic management process or institutional harassment, the answer is you are going too far. <laughs> Before we went too far for the standard harassment and now we want to, to, to make a step further. Uh, so thank you again, Marie, and I leave the floor to you. Thank you, Cristiano. Uh, uh, I'd like first to say I'm happy to be back for this uh, 223 year and uh, let's hope we can work together to make the workplace a better place to live. So today I'm going to try to tell you about what does psychological harassment at work stand for? Because of course, as you know, I'm 71 by uh, by now, and I started the first consultation to Francais Travail in 1995. It was the first one, and uh, 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 it was a baroque and a weird uh, way of uh, trying to cope with the calming symptoms of all the patients coming to see me in the Hospital de Nanterre. And at that time, nobody was talking about psychological harassment, although we all know it does exist since the beginning of uh, mankind, probably. So um, 
let's say that uh, uh, we've seen a lot of increase of psychological disorder associated with uh, uh, organizational arrangement at work and new management procedure and that the focus only on uh, uh, perverse moral harassment is the wrong way to look at the picture and to try to analyze the situation. Um, I always start with the power of work on the construction of our identity. We do get up every day in the morning to go to work somewhere so that we can tell other people who we are and what we are capable of doing, what we want to accomplish uh, as far as uh, our existence on this earth, that we want to be recognized for our own skills and that most of the time we choose a job uh, according to the wishes of our parents, according to the social background we were born in, according also maybe to the childhood issues we've been through and the job we want to have uh, when we become grown up can be somehow a way of uh, healing those uh, childhood um, uh, failure. Uh, of course, uh, trying to find the best job for yourself is also a great promise of social empowerment and uh, of uh, earning a uh, uh, way of, uh, of life. Uh, since the, the early days of the notion of souffrance au travail, suffering at, at works, through the picture of moral uh, harassment, we have seen two currents always confronting themselves. The first one, of course, since the publication of a book of Marie-France Irigoyen, uh, The Moral Harassment, uh, Perverse uh, Situation at Work, um, you've seen a lot of people saying there are narcissistic perverts everywhere being born, I don't know how and why. And you have a lot of very fragile workers and these two people are meant to meet each other and to harm one another. Of course, if you look at the situation through this uh, uh, picture, you are confronted to what we call the naturalization of this phenomenon. And as you know, by now, since I've been doing these uh, lectures, uh, I belong to the second current, the one who has been studying uh, the very profound changes in the new management, in the new organizational patterns at work, and what the new way of organizing work has been doing to body and to psyche of the worker. And this is uh, this second current I'm going to talk about, of course. Um, I'm not taking all this out of my mind just for the pleasure of uh, not agreeing with a psychiatrist talking about perversion. I uh, think it's because I met in my consultation but, but back then in 1995, a lot of workers coming from uh, uh, La Défense, which was um, a very special place uh, in uh, Paris where you have all the uh, uh, great offices and great firms. And they could bring me that type of management guide, change management guide, uh, which I could read uh, with some kind of horror because it was written exactly and I underline all those um, words that you could manage people with two ways when you wanted them to move from one type of uh, organization to another one as quickly as possible. Uh, the first one was to try to hire a new manager, very, very um, charismatic one. I'm not sure it's that easy to find them. The second solution that was strictly written and rather horrifying to read was you have to scare people. They need to fear 
what you're asking them so that they'll move faster and they'll do exactly what you ask them to do. And that was unbelievable to see that return as a scientific way of managing uh, people. So let's go back to the change in the organization of work and all the consequences on the health of the workers, uh, which is, I think, a better way to do the right prevention uh, of uh, social risk, uh, rather than trying to find uh, rotten people in their mind. As you all know, since we move from industrial capitalism to financial capitalism, the production of value is no longer to be searched in work, but instead in the new management method. At a time, you could, for example, build something extraordinary, sell a lot of a type of items, and uh, if you had sold a lot and if you had money left, you would pay better your engineer, uh, your workers, you would invest in new items. And if there was money left, you would give money to your investors. This is the old way of uh, building capitalism. Uh, nowadays, as you know, you have first to give money to your investors and then with the rest, you have to try to do the best work you can, but of course, there's not as much money left and you have to put on new management method so that you can, um, of course, do the same job with less people, less time, less offices, less tools. The most common forms of new work organization in most of the companies, most of the establishment today are these ones. Uh, everywhere in, two, in 2023, you know it more than anybody else, but everybody knows the workload, what you have to do every day uh, has become more and more difficult to absorb because of the time pressure, because of the complexity of a procedure. And most of the time, all of us work in what is called a degraded mode. You do what you can, you don't do everything, then you don't do exactly the, a good work, a good job. Uh, in second will come the emotional uh, uh, requirement, in particular when you have to be confronted to the public, and to a public that most of the time is deceived or in anger because what you gave back to this public is not well done. Uh, it has been done in a rush, it has been done with the wrong tools or with people not good enough in their job. And so they bring back the item and they're not happy at all. And then all the workers on this front line have to be confronted every day with a very, very uh, uh, angry public. The third item is that because of all the procedure, because of the algorithm, because of everything being so numerized, technically, totally processed, you totally lack of autonomy and of uh, capacity, personal capacity of changing the way you could do your job. Uh, you can do nothing about the way you have to work and you can put nothing of your intelligence in this new way of working. Of course, as every one of us is alone, like I am in front of my computer, uh, but as you are most of the time, even on the, in your office, in uh, your uh, uh, open space, uh, you lack of social support, you lack of cooperation from the management and the work colleague. And I must say that the pandemic has done wrong to all of us by increasing this loneliness. Besides, of course, when the management benchmark the colleagues, when you are put in competition one with the other, 
what kind of support do you expect from your colleague? Most of us will just do their job and say nothing about our own invention, our little tricks. I'm not going to share my tricks with my colleague, otherwise he's going to say it's his. And uh, that increases the loneliness. And of course, this type of job, taking all the room in your life, uh, is putting a, a real hard time on people as having a, uh, a true and solid limit between your social life, your professional life, and your intimate and familiar life. Every one of us has a room or desk at home where you can work. Everyone is connecting when the children are resting. Everyone in the middle of the night can get up and say, I forgot that and go back to the computer. Everyone is working during the, the weekend time. Uh, as you can imagine, of course, the lack of recognition, the feeling of uselessness of this work being done so badly will put you in um, an atmosphere of loss of meaning of the work you are doing. So what's the use of getting up every day if the work I do cannot make me uh, a great professional, if I'm ashamed of the way I'm working? And even more, if it puts me in a conflict of value, because what I do is bad things. If I hurt my patients, if I don't um, uh, build the thing I have to build correctly, and if I know it's going to break soon, and the public is going to be mad and come back again. And of course, because of all this, change management because it changes all the time because instead of hiring colleagues and new people instead of giving me the new tools instead of giving me space and time to do things better most of the time my hierarchy will give me a new way of working because that costs nothing i'm gonna feel more and more insecure I'm going to be, um, uh, we say in French, a, a novice, somebody who has never worked before in the way they want me to work. And I'm going to lose the self-esteem I had before because I could rely on my uh, professional skills. And as you can imagine, all these factors are uh, causing tension uh, in the uh, relationship of people working together. And uh, in some cases, especially in where is one colleague saying, I cannot work like that. Um, this way of doing my job is just excruciating me. Uh, I don't want to keep on doing my job like that. In front of all, all the others who are going to say, come on, you don't care. Just do your job the way they ask you to do it. You're going to see the beginning of what we call um, bullying, transversal uh, harassment at work. Please, shut up. Don't tell us we are not working well. Please stop criticizing this new way of uh, working. And if uh, the manager is not keen on knowing what's going on in his team, everything can happen to this very, very lonely uh, victim. Um, what will produce this uh, type of new management, as you can imagine, is not only harassment at work. You're going to have two types of pathology that you will recognize on yourself, and that maybe, unfortunately, you have already experienced. Of course, you start with stress. And most people are going to say, come on, this is just stress. This is usual life. We're not going to take care of stress. You should, because this is what the law asks uh, the direction to do. You have to evaluate the stress. 
your management is provoking and you have to do everything to stop it before it becomes chronic. And stress, if it lasts more than six months, will become chronical. Anxiety, am I going to be able to do that every day? I'm gonna, am I going to be able to sustain this type of job till my uh, retirement, till next year, till next month? Finally, I'm going to disengage myself from this job because I don't find myself anymore. I cannot recognize what I'm doing. And of course, because you are interrupted all the time, because you are overwhelmed with mail, phone calls, text, you're going to start having cognitive disorder. And I regret not to see you all because if I was asking the question, who here doesn't have problem with memory, logic and concentration, please raise your hand if you're okay. Nobody will raise his hands. You will have, of course, acute stress, then burnout syndrome, and then, of course, post-traumatic stress, especially if you are really harassed. And unfortunately, and we've done a, um, a lecture about uh, uh, the suicide uh, at work and what they do stand for, uh, I just don't know how to get out of this situation. And uh, since I don't know who to turn to, since I don't really know exactly who are the people I'm supposed to go to and ask for help, since I'm in the very narrow part of a hole I'm falling into, I'm going to kill myself. Not that I don't like, not that I don't like life. I just want to rest. I just want to put an end to this. And this is where the maximum risk of suicide stands. Of course, you will have also all the violent behavior of people, violence against the users, between colleagues, against the working tool like sabotage, against management. And of course, you will have also some kind of very sharp and mean attitude in the management, totally compressed between what the top level is asking from them and what the bottom, the colleagues, the team are trying to sell their sufferings. At that time, most of managers are just increasing the pressure on everybody. And you will have a third way of uh, breaking down, which is, of course, musculoskeletal disorder and all your uh, heart problems, stroke, uh, weight yo, yo metabolic syndrome, and uh, all of you know exactly uh, what the body has to pay to the uh, change management that has not been evaluated by the top level of the administration. So, as you can see, talking all the time about harassment has not a real meaning when you don't know exactly the definition of what are the psychosocial risks. And I really like the definition that uh, Michel Golac, a French economist, gave uh, at the demand of our uh, work um, uh, minister of the time, uh, Mr. Xavier Bertrand. Psycholo psychosocial risk or risk to mental, physical, social health generated by employment condition, organizational interpersonal factors that may interact with mental functioning. As you see, nowhere you read that there are very weak and fragile workers that you have to check upon. The definition is only about what has changed in the way you organized the work must have an input, a tremendous one, on mental and physical health of the workers. And I think nothing better than the Karasek model is useful. As you know, on this 
line, you have what we call the autonomy, the way you can you do something on your own, on the way you work, and on the other side, you have the workload, the psychological demand. And as you all know, you can therefore have free square, the relaxed one, which doesn't exist any longer, where you are not asked very much and you can do it the way you want. I don't know these people anymore. Uh, uh, you're going to have a very low demand and you have a very low latitude. You have to do it the way you you have to do it. Maybe you can put there this very uh, <laughs> lousy word of brown out when you are bored at work. I, I hate this uh, syndrome. Uh, you have also what we call the active square. You are demanded a lot, but you can do it as much as you want the way you want. Uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid uh, this doesn't exist any longer. And even in the old um, métier like surgeon, doctors, magistrate, uh, you can no longer choose the way you operate, the people you uh, operate with, the operating your room you want to, to be in. Everything is dictated elsewhere. And I think we are not now, every one of us here in the job strain, a very high demand and a very low latitude. So I think this uh, schema, this scheme is the right one to use when you want to try to understand why in the end you go straight forward to uh, management harassment. And of course, you must never forget that the biggest help you have to put in the workplace is social support. Don't isolate your colleague. Don't isolate the people that are working together. The lack of social support is a very, very high health risk. You all know uh, the different factors. Um, uh, what is asked at work? Uh, excessive quantity, do you have the time to do your job correctly? Uh, are you frequently interrupted? Do, do you need to do things very, very quickly? Do you have to think too many things at the same time? And so how do you manage to have your own life aside your work life? As you can see, this questionnaire of Golak is a very pragmatic one and really it's the one you know, everybody should use so that you make the right prevention. Uh, the famous emotional uh, requirement, when you are in contact with the public, when you have to uh, show empathy to understand what the people want, when you have to hide your emotion to keep cool, when you have to deny that you are afraid where you work because you know it's scary or it's um, uh, dangerous, then you are at risk. Uh, the famous autonomy, uh, nothing can increase better the professional you are than the capacity you have to dig in yourself and find new ways of doing the job, new skills, new intelligence inside yourself to execute the procedure that has been invented somewhere in the uh, methodological uh, desk. You are the one kind of, that can improve uh, the procedure if the only thing asked from you is to obey, just do it the way we want you to do it, you're going to see your work becoming very poor. And of course, you're going to retrieve yourself and your intelligence from the job you are doing. As I said it before, the way of uh, being together, the way of uh, uh, helping the workers, the way of being recognized for what you've done, the way of having a manager with a great leadership uh, will be of great help. Otherwise, if 
When you ask for help, the only answer you get is you've got to find the answer by yourself. So I don't know about your job, just follow the procedure. And uh, if when you ask your co-workers, nobody answers you, then you will have, a, of course, conflict in the team. And uh, once again, bullying. Maybe uh, the most increasing factors uh, at the time being are these ones, the ethical conflicts. In France, as you know, we have uh, the Enquête Sumer, uh, which is a, a predictive um, statistical survey. And in, two, in, two, in 2019, 47% of the French workers were saying they were having um, a conflict of value when they were working because they were disapproving the way they were working because they knew it was uh, bad work, what we call uh, uh, qualité empêchée. And of course, always we'll produce one thing. How can I work till my retirement? How can I do this hard job alone so quickly? This uh, job hurting my body and my uh, my emotion till the end of my professional career. I know I won't be able to do that. And uh, all this is making me very insecure. I, as you know, today's a day of strike in France because of uh, uh, the new law on uh, the, the year of retirement. It's not that we don't want to work till uh, 65, 66, 67. It's because we think we have first to discuss on uh, uh, is it sustainable to work in this bad condition till that old age. I think a nurse would answer no. I think uh, a lot of workers would answer no. I cannot do that. Um, we've already done lectures on uh, harassment, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the French legal definition, which I think is a very good one. Uh, I'm just trying to recall that we need in France three necessary condition to have a, a, a real characterized uh, situation of harassment, repeated conduct, uh, deterioration of working condition, and of course, uh, infringement of a right and of a health a victim of this uh, action. How many repeated uh, conduct? Only two. One is not enough. One is a, uh, an aggression, a violence. Two can be uh, moral harassment. Uh, we also say that no employee, which means that uh, the head staff, the CEO, can be harassed by uh, uh, all the worker, that a manager can be harassed by his team, uh, and that one colleague among the team can be harassed by his colleague. So um, I think our definition, definition are pretty good. We have also clarified a lot um, what stays in many countries, that you have to be intentional and very bad-minded to be uh, uh, harasser? No, in France, unfortunately, you can arrest someone even not wanting to just because uh, you put too much pressure, you put, you, you ask for too many things in too little time. And so even if you don't have the intention, but if what you do, as far as management is concerned, as, as consequences is concerned, um, a lot of harm done to the health, to the career, then it is called moral harassment. And of course, in France, we have obtained the reversal of the burden of proof. Um, the victim doesn't have to give proof. The victim has to give facts suggesting the existence of psychological harassment. And it is up to the top level of the uh, 
uh, enterprise to uh, demonstrate that what is done to this employee has nothing to do with moral uh, harassment. Also, and I think this is a good thing, you don't have to be dead, you don't have to be totally broken to prove you've been moral, morally harassed. The potential damage you risk to present, like the PTSD syndrome, is enough to prove that you are in a moral harassment situation. And uh, of course, as we've said it before, uh, in France, we have about a thousand cases of ruling per year at the Cour de Cassation, which is the top level of our uh, system of uh, justice. And um, usually our victims, when they come to see us in the consultation, say, I'm not going to go to justice because I'm not going to win. And we have to give them the numbers. Not that we want exactly them to be um, in justice, but 80% of the conviction uh, do win their civil matters. So it's kind of a good um, way of saying that harassment exists. I'm going to leave aside the individual harassment because, as you all know, it's been written a lot of things about it. And uh, to go on the horizontal uh, harassment, because this one is carried between staff with no hierarchical relationship. And it relies on manager to be very, very careful on what happens in their team. If there is someone alone being put apart of a team with nobody talking any longer to this person, the manager should uh, be very, very careful about what's going on and be, be ask this person, what's going on for a month? You haven't come to the cafeteria, nobody's talking to you, you're not talking to anybody, what's going on? It's not that the person has become um, unsocial or uh, depressed in primary intention. It's maybe because she has been trying to keep the contact, but she's been harassed collectively and nobody talking to her, the person has decided to cut all the ties to the team. Be careful to this one. And of course, the one that is uh, the main thing to give attention to is uh, the management practices that have spread everywhere. Uh, which are affecting the social relationship, which are affecting the dignity of individuals, we are, which are damaging the working condition. And we are going to see a few examples. You have also, come on, let's be honest, strategic harassment to get rid of the old ones, of the black ones, of a woman, of LGBT ones, of the one with differences that we do not want to keep in the team. And this is, of course, is discrimination. And you have also the type of management with lack of intentionality, but which produces the same result and uh, the same health condition, the same end of uh, career for workers, and uh, as we don't require any intentionality, we have to focus on only one thing, um, try to give the right formation to our managers so that they know what is organizational psychological harassment and uh, the harm it does to people. I'm not going back to France Telecom, as you all know that the intention was crude and that Philippe Lombard had built inside the structure a school for the manager to have uh, thousands of fonctionnaires leaving uh, the institution. Uh, this was a very sad story with 70 suicides. Uh, attempt. Uh, of course, it's not your job to become a psychiatrist, but I have to 
uh, clear your attention to what it causes, a PTSD syndrome. So if some of you experience what we call um, this traumatic neurosis, if you uh, feel tachycardia, tremors, sweatings when you are at work, if you think all the time with flashback to what's been told to you in a very harsh and aggressive way, if you feel panic attack on the way to your job, if you have intrusing work nightmares, if you have reactive insomnia, not to make these nightmares anymore, if you begin to have cognitive impairment, if you have totally lost your self-esteem, if you feel bad, wrong, um, guilty of what's happening to you, if you feel like you have to justify your work all the time, and if you feel ready to kill yourself because all of this is much too hard to stand for, then you have the exact syndrome of what we call the moral harassment. Please go and see a therapist and have a sick leave because when it becomes chronic, we won't be able to cure you. And of course, as you can imagine, this doesn't show. You can look at your uh, worker on the office right beside you and you won't see anything at all. Uh, the trap is that you won't be able to answer to uh, what is asked from you because you're scared of disciplinary measure. Of course, the trap lies because you cannot escape. You cannot quit. You're going to use your social right. Uh, you cannot escape because you're scared of losing your job and not finding another one. And at this point of despair in the corner, once again, suicide could be a way of liberating yourself. So let us be careful to what the, we say to uh, our team workers and to our subordinate, our colleague. And let's look at all the way you can harm someone just by managing. Please uh, don't overuse uh, the interpersonal practice. Uh, don't use a too familiar form uh, to humiliate people. Don't interrupt people all the time because sometimes they have important things to say about the job. Uh, try to avoid a high and threatening level of voice. Uh, try to remember to say good morning, goodbye to everybody. I know it takes time. This extra time is necessary to preserve dignity in the workplace. Uh, try to keep on communicate with people even if you're in conflict with them and try not to transform the uh, evaluation interview in some kind of uh, uh, judgment place with uh, emotional destabilization because uh, with this type of atmosphere, it's going to be hard for people to be under your orders. Of course, uh, try to avoid to isolate uh, people by changing the meal schedule. Try not to fail in providing information for the meetings and then criticize the absent because it shows the person you are criticizing because she didn't come to the meeting can show you she never received a mail. Try also to keep on communicating uh, about meetings necessary to the performance at work. And of course, it's totally awful to ask people not to talk to the designated person, because that way you are building a bullying place for this person. Try not to be complicity for some, too rigorous for others. Try to give workload the most equal way in quantity and quality. Uh, of, co of course, you, I know you've been taught very, very strategic, competitive method of management in the different school you went through because this is so a la mode. 
but uh, this breaks all the collective of work they breaks the necessity of uh, fighting together and of supporting together and once again don't stigmatize an employee try not to use the disciplinary uh, practice too much uh, i know there are work uh, places where you monitor fact and gesture where you control the email uh, the telephone when you report all the time when you check that people are connected that you check the conversation try also not to be too punitive with a repeated refusal of training requests with uh, uh, disciplinary meetings with uh, uh, systematic memos sometimes people spend more time answering to your memo than really working and of course the main thing is try to let people do the best uh, as far as their job is uh, concerned so try to avoid the uh, paradoxical injunction uh, the rigid requirement for from reality uh, don't ask them to glue stamps at four millimeter for the edge of the envelope and uh, try also uh, to be um, as um, equitable as necessary don't remove task or workstation to give them to another without informing the employee don't block the access to everything don't delete the employee uh, from the chart without telling her or him give work that does correspond to the qualification and as you can see you can also give so much to people that the what you the, the overload of activity will lead to burnout syndrome and as you can see these practices uh, are all, all uh, to be pay, placed in uh, confrontation with rules of laws uh, because they correspond to what we call um, uh, managerial uh, institutional uh, management so let's finish with a little quiz and then if you are okay I, I will answer to your uh, different question uh, the quiz is necessary because I'm sure nobody has uh, understood exactly what is harassment when you think you are already under water you are given a work overload a new one uh, your manager will say this, this is exceptional, but the tone says that uh, you cannot refuse. Is this psychological harassment? In fact, if it is temporary, why not? But you have to be careful. Even if it's not psychological harassment, I have to remember that you are obliged to protect the physical and mental health of your agent. Uh, there are known only one law to protect the body at work, but two. Uh, and it's necessary to remember la portée de l'obligation de l'employeur. Sometimes tasks related to your job have been decreasing. You are not given as much as before and you start to worry. Or you've been told you have become bad and you've been removed from your task. Is this moral harassment in the case one your sector of activity is disappearing disappearing and managers in the top level have to be very very careful about uh, giving the right information to the people who are uh, going to lose the things they were doing in the case number two of course if you no longer receive a mail if you are removed from files if you are transferred um, in another office, if you are set aside from your task, if somebody else takes ownership of your job, and uh, of course this is moral harassment with a very strong technique to prove you that you don't exist any any longer. And be very very careful of what we call micromanagement. Uh, this insistent reporting of what you do which is called very persecutory 
because this is unbearable to be checked upon 24 hours a day. Give some space to the people working. Be um, trustful in their capacity. Uh, for some times, the atmosphere at work has been bad. Everybody's shouting, getting angry, yelling. You are even sidelined. Is this moral harassment? I guess yes. Of course, uh, sometimes in the workplace you can have conflict, you can have, have disagreement, but if she, the top level of a hierarchy does nothing, the conflict become violence and become the role of harassment. You must organize the workload in a door in order to avoid this hostile behavior, which is the source of psychosocial risk. Uh, your manager is calling you, speaking loudly to you, criticizing you all the time. Is this more harassment? Of course, we can imagine that a manager who is under pressure will become um, totally uh, unbearable. And you have to know that uh, because it is uh, psychological harassment, siege, a judgment. In France, the Court of Cassation has accepted that management methods constitute psychological harassment. And the attention has to be drawn to the very, very, very uneasy difference between uh, very directive management and the uh, uh, harassing one. Your manager just called you dump, dopey, or bastard in public. This is not moral harassment. This is a verbal aggression. This is a violence. And this is not legal at all. Uh, because it can trigger a state of distress and be declared, at last in France, as an accident at work. Your premises are outdated. The software no longer works. You lack resources and colleagues to do your job. Is this more world harassment? Yes. Look at all the different uh, instances in different tribunals uh, declaring that the lack of good material resources and good working condition really is uh, what we call institutional uh, harassment. So, uh, of course, you can call psychological harassment when your subordinates are against you, laugh at you, get away from your prescription, and uh, you can harass your superior, it is possible, and it's not legal, of course, and you have to be careful, because in that case, the superior committed suicide. As you can see, the situation is very complex. You need to know exactly the different definition. You need to know the specific syndrome. You need to know that work is so important and so central that you can harm people when you manage them in the wrong way. But you need also to know that you can save their health when you are a good manager enough, capable of saying, You've worked so well today. You've done so well, even though we didn't have a time. We didn't have all we needed. You're a great worker. I know I can rely on you. Thank you for what you did. And thank you for listening. I'm waiting for your questions. <clears throat> many, many thanks, Marie. Uh, if you look on the chat, uh, everything is thanking you for the excellent, outstanding presentation. Uh, yes, we confirm that it, it will be published on our website and also on our YouTube channel. <clears throat> uh, I would like to, to raise a question uh, because during the negotiation, we came across a statement from our administration mentioning that the good products around on several member states uh, are based on the following. We, they want to encourage the victim to raise the matter directly with the alleged harasser. 
to explain what behavior they find unwelcome and to make clear that they wanted to stop it. Uh, what we were arguing is that to ask the victim to directly interact as a first and even to encourage him or her to do it with the legislature uh, uh, <clears throat> is not going to, to protect the victim and to impose such first approach uh, will put the victim that will refuse it in a worse position because the alleged harasser would argue, why did you, you didn't come to me to explain? Uh, so is it true that it's a good product because we are not convinced at all about it? Oh, I'm not convinced at all as a psychoanalyst because um, the PTSD syndrome is a pathology of loneliness. Moral harassment produces loneliness. If people around you defend you when you are uh, attacked or uh, humiliated in public, you can say that you, it's not good to feel that, to experience that, but you having the protection and the support of a, of a team, you are not isolated. And so, uh, by definition, uh, moral harassment is a, a lonely situation. So to ask the victim uh, who hasn't been able to talk to anyone, to go directly to the harasser, uh, to explain he doesn't feel well, he feels like he's harassed, uh, is a tremendous psychological catastrophe because most of the time, as I said, when I try to describe a syndrome, you're making nightmares at night, you're making nightmares about your uh, harasser, you are uh, uh, scared of uh, crossing him in the corridor, uh, talking to him or to her is the last thing you want to do. Even though you know it is um, um, an institutional management, uh, an institutional way of, of organizing the work, it is embodied uh, by the person of your manager. And whether you want it or not, you are scared of him. So this is the least thing you can do. Go to him and try to have a nice and soft and, and good conversation with him. This is, I'm sorry, totally unbelievable. And um, to, to think this is possible. Nobody would do that. You mm. can go and ask the uh, Médecin du travail, if there is one, you can go and ask the nurse, if there is one, you can go and ask the délégué du personnel, but, uh, and ask your manager if it's not the manager who is doing something to you uh, intentionally or not. But you cannot go and see the manager if he's the one putting the pressure because you will be too scared and feel too bad to express yourself correctly. And I think the manager <laughs> won't find it very easy to be treated like that either. This is, I'm sorry, this is ridiculous. No. Ah, we, <laughs> I'm really happy that you confirm that our reserve was uh, duly justified because the answer was, you don't know that is the, among the best products around the world to do it. And uh, we really don't see how it can be a good product. And we will keep on asking this uh, sentence to be removed. Um, another item that I would like to, to discuss with you briefly, um, our administration is trying to, to put uh, together harassment and conflict at work. Uh, that's why they want to, to have the mediation service to intervene uh, in case of potential harassment. And they are uh, pretending that the two filiers are totally different. And once you go to the mediation, um, mentioning that is a conflict of a work, uh, you can no longer go back eventually to the uh, services in charge of harassment. Uh, and we, we mentioned that we don't see things so clear cut, uh, harassment is a, such a conflict. I mean, 
uh, and we don't see how we could eventually pretend that is an option for a colleague to decide to go for the harassment filiere or to the mediation and once he or she has decided he cannot go back to the order uh, which which are the con the, the, i mean the the, the contact on uh, on france in from france for example within uh, uh, mediation and harassment uh, it's a very interesting question because we uh have been building a team of uh, mediator of work since a few months. And if you are interested, we could do um, a presentation of the way we, they work. Mm -hmm. And that type of situation, we are having webinar with uh, Preventica that you can find on their website with Les Mediateurs du Travail. Mm -hmm. And of course, our mediator uh, always say when you have a, a very strong, um, sharp conflict at, at work, especially between a, a colleague and a, a manager, it's always tinted with uh, subordination and then, of course, a little bit of uh, uh, harassment. Uh, for our mediator, if uh, during the sessions, the different interviews with the two persons. They finally put at, uh, in the light uh, an harassment situation. The mediation stops immediately, mm. immediately. Uh, this is not the place for a mediation. This is the place for uh, an enquête on harassment. And uh, you can go from mediation to harassment, from harassment to mediation. As far as uh, the people taking care of this situation are well um, provided with uh, strong uh, experiences on both types of processes. So if you are interested, some of our mediators could uh, provide yeah. you with a lecture on this subject yeah well yeah, it will be very helpful because yeah. we are we are not satisfied at all about how the mediation service of our institution works there are just few colleagues for several hundred people and they are I mean, they are totally unable to find the solutions because they have no legal means to do it um, and finally we are normally confronted, as you have rightly mentioned, with the lack of assistance of colleagues around. Uh, they don't bother, they don't want to be in trouble themselves. And what we are preaching now, and we have the, the support of the legal service, is to apply for harassment. Um, an article of our staff regulation that is quite clear, uh, I have the French version, uh, and reads, uh, the fonctionnaire qui dans l'exercice ou à l'occasion de l'exercice de ses fonctions a connaissance des faits qui peuvent laisser présumer une activité illégale éventuelle <coughs> ou une conduite en uh, rapport avec l'exercice de ses fonctions cons pouvant constituer un grave manquement aux obligations du fonctionnaire en a, a en informe immédiatement son supérieur hiérarchique, son directeur général ou l'OLAF. Uh, so, uh, um, we are under the obligation, if we are confronted to something that could eventually be legal or unacceptable under the staff regulation, uh, not just to keep silent, but to inform. It is a duty, it's not an option. Uh, and we are putting now on the new decision this obligation for the rest of the colleagues, they so, so often and too often, in my view, are just looking around without helping the colleague who is the victim. Uh, and what is totally unacceptable in our institution is that if we deal with, a, let's say, a public procurement for 500 euros and you make uh, mistakes, everything becomes immense. Uh, if, you, if you go for a maltreatance or harassment for several colleagues, no one cares. So we try to put also the harassment under the financial aspect of the management because the institution are totally afraid of a procedure which is called the discharge of the European Parliament because at the end of the year, they must get their blessing that they well uh, <clears throat> employed the budget. Uh, and we managed to convince the parliament that uh, uh, harassment has also a side financial expect. And that's why we, we managed, for example, for the social committee to have the discharge refused 
just because there, there were several cases of harassment. Uh, and to have this uh, pressure on the system that no one can say, I don't care, I don't want to be bothered, I don't want to put myself in trouble, and I just close my eyes, uh, I think that is perhaps is a bit uh, rude, but is the only way out. Otherwise, we are always confronted with the fact that colleagues around say, poor victim, we understand, but we don't want to be ourselves in the same position. Uh, I mean, one can consider it as a coward attitude, but still is the reality. Uh, it is, it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what you are saying means that you are lacking from what I would call acteur de prevention, intermediaire, yeah. uh, in place. Because otherwise, if it is uh, somebody is harassed and you have to tell it to the top level of the hierarchy, this is an on-off uh, kind of answer, a very, very difficult one. And that, of course, will reinforce the silence and uh, I'm not going to talk about it because it's too complicated. I'm going to shut up. I'm not going to say what I saw. Um, and this is the worst situation. What you have to do to have a real prevention from all those social risk is to put in place um, what we call a first responder, the legal ones and the one that are volunteers to see what's happening and to refer to the right person. You need a, a médecin du travail, assistante sociale, a psychologue du travail. You need uh, all the uh, very experienced people that know how to deal uh, with this type of situation. Uh, if you lack of these um, intermediaires or these uh, people, you will always be in an on-off situation. I'm not going to say anything, otherwise it's going to be a nuclear bomb. This is not helpful. Yeah, but what we are confronted of is uh, always the situation in which the last in the hierarchical chain is found to be guilty, and all the rest, even if the instruction came from the, 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 the top, are pretending we don't know or we, we were not directly involved uh, and when it comes to to deal with the financial fraud this kind of argument has totally rejected because the article 22 of the self-regulation imposed to anyone not just to say i decide eventually to but you are under the obligation to do it uh, and so far this article has never been applied for this kind of uh, uh, harassment or other was just based on the financial irregularities. And now we, we have convinced the legal service that it's not really what the legislator has decided because it's not only on fraud, it's also on any professional mistake. That's why we managed to have involved in the system uh, uh, the anti-fraud uh, office that is totally independent uh, because the, the independence of the actor is also a crucial element because people are not just afraid, they are also not trusting the actors and that's why they say i don't want to take the risk because i i'm not now we have for example for one service we we managed to have a sort of chambre de coot and everyone is even if the director general of the administration has confirmed under my personal uh, responsibility i will confirm that everything will be kept confidential uh, staff are saying i don't trust the system of, of course <laughs> of course of course uh, still, I think, uh, like you use the term of a person who is guilty, I think if we go on this track, uh, nothing good will, um, no good decision will be taken. I think uh, you don't need to look for the guilty person. You need to do everything so that it won't happen again. Yeah. This, this is a more... Uh, helpful and pragmatic way of looking at the moral harassment uh, at work. Yeah, we will try to do it. And uh, but it is also true that when it comes to open an investigation, at the end of the investigation, there is someone who is considered to be guilty or maybe, not. Maybe responsible. 
yeah uh, okay yeah okay. so but guilty is a strong word uh, which can lead to suicide for some yeah, manager who sure. is caught in that type of uh, symbolic in interpretation yeah, yeah that's true i mean i was a shocking all the colleagues that when i mentioned during the last meeting uh, that the the best the most important move in harassment was the case law which uh, the intention was not a condition yeah and then everyone seems to consider that the, the harasser is always the perverse nar narcissistic no, 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 no. No, no, this is over. <laughs> no, no, this is definitely over. We all know everywhere in all the country, in all the scientific publication, yeah, that is true. it is not a question of perversion, but a question of uh, work organization. So please try to get rid of a perverse version. Yeah, but, but it's quite I know. It's very sexy and very exciting, but it's not the right one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, but to, to be considered an arrestor in, in a way, I'll answer you the some plain grace can be surprising, but still is the best way to go. And I mean, all our cases, I was uh, witnessing all the cases and the few cases that we managed to were made by those who were in good faith considering to do their job. Their job. And sometimes <laughs> what they are asked for is harassment because it's too much, too much in a short time. Yeah. without the tools and without all the necessary people and this is harassment yeah okay it's good i see few colleagues uh i'm from experience harassment the only possible to allow the psychology race to the neglect all of clues there uh yeah and then uh, uh, every time that you say that you trust uh, any actor there are others who mention uh, my past experience I cannot trust them. <laughs> they close their eyes. I mean, it's uh, it's based on the personal experience. It's clear. Uh, it's also true, as uh, one colleague is mentioning, that in the commission there is a really poor prevention. Uh, That's the main problem. That's the poor prevention. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we start now. Uh, I mean, I, I think the DICRA has been uh, preaching in the desert for months. Uh, the risk, the prevention, the risk psychosocial at the beginning it seems to be something very exotic. Now they start eventually thinking about uh, they are really very few, not few, just few. Mm. One of two colleagues who made a training in prevention. Uh, everything is made just by bricolage. They have put in place a sort of network of volunteers, but I'm um, and they pretend to be able to do it in just a few days of training or they they organize two days of training and then they have a list of potential investigators i mean can you imagine what you can do uh okay i try to see if there are already case uh, uh yeah there is one colleague mentioning if uh, voluntary 24 uh hours per day in standby duty uh, without compensation. Is it an institutional harassment? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's not go too far. <laughs> uh, OK. Uh, what happened at Telecom France and Air Liquid once? Uh, I mean, Telecom is very well known. Air Liquid, I don't know. Is something on Air Liquid? I don't know. Okay, we will eventually cross check with the colleague. Um, and uh, perhaps the last question for on me: uh, we we managed to have the intervention of this uh, uh, anti-fraud of office that is a fully fledged independent with a very standing professionals. People have been making investigation for years before me recruited. And still, we will have our internal office for mm -hmm. investigation. Um, that is a, a, a totally different level. And it's clear that the big one cannot take all the cases. So we are trying to set sort of criteria. We want to avoid the perception that they are uh, justice at the vitesse. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, so we, we managed to have some criteria, for example, if there is a senior manager concern, it's clear that independence is a much more important. Uh, if there is a structural concern uh, that could eventually have a reputational risk. Uh, but we know that, for example, in France, the actors are always the same, whoever is concerned. Of course, because we are legal actors. Yeah. So we are much more structured than you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because so, I mean, uh... Uh, there's no difference for us where we always be uh, the top level, the inspection du travail, the médecine du travail, délégué du personnel, CSE. Uh, we have a very strong, strong architecture of legal preventer. Yeah, I mean, as you see, we, we, we work day by day trying to improve uh -huh. the situation, but I mean, things are moving in the good direction, at least. Uh, there will be a, a new uh, advisor on harassment that they will take care of all the policy on the informal procedure before opening up the investigations. Uh, is going to be at the highest grades on our staff regulation. So at the level of director general, uh, it will be recruited outside the institution uh, with a strong background. We will ask the staff committee to be on the selection and also the European Ombudsman. So, I mean, it's already a good signal that they take care of, of, of this file. But again, uh, then you can have a wrong choice and to have the wrong person uh, on power. But I mean, uh, at least we, have, we will have someone who will you be will there. You will have someone and let's hope he will have the right training uh, yeah. to put some peace in this very, very touchy subject. Yeah, and perhaps we will also rely on your uh, support when we will come to establish the requirements for this post. Uh, what kind of experience will be helpful or something like that. Okay. Okay, I don't see any other. Yeah, the chief confidential counselor uh, is the name. Uh, uh, we want to have uh, the harassment coordinator, so we will discuss about the name, but at least there is someone. Uh, uh, we were asking that uh, two years ago, and the answer was, are you crazy or what? Now they put that on the proposal, so you see that things are moving. So, you see, finally, <laughs> you just have to be patient and obstinate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true, and your help has been really important for us. As our lawyers used to say, you try, you fail, you try, you fail, you try, you succeed. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> that is true. Okay, I think that I went more or less through the question that, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there are some peculiar questions, the, the, the link between Nazism and management, I think that we went uh, a bit too a far. Book, a, a book written about that, so I'm not going to talk about this book, okay? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's true. Okay, so uh, I think that we, we came to the end of this uh, very fruitful uh, conference. So we, we thank you again, Maria, again and again. It's uh, nice to see you all again. Okay, we will have a new conference in the near future and we will keep in touch for the negotiation. I mean. Okay, try to keep all of you in good health and to protect yourself. That's the main thing, okay? That is true. <laughs> okay.